So my question was how, how to overcome the doubt when the doubt arrives. Okay. It does arrive. Can you be more specific when you say doubt? Mm -hmm. Because doubt could be in relation to so many things. Not fully trusting the self. Not fully trusting that that's all there is. Again, it's like being clarified again and again and again, either with the thoughts or with the emotions or with the um, distractions or... I know that, of course, there, there are certain limitations in the way the language is, can play on us, on, on, on both of us right now. But when you say um, the self, Right? Whether to doubt the self, like what do you mean by that? Which self are you speaking about? Consciousness, the absolute. Okay, so in other words, doubt in relation to the absolute, doubt in relation to consciousness, doubt in relation to the self. Yeah. What kind of doubt? Whether it exists or not, whether it's all there is? How can you doubt? I'm just curious. I just want to get... Doubting that I'm fully that. Okay. Not fully committed going for that. But there is a difference. Doubting that you are that. And doubting whether you are going towards that. Let's clarify it there. So that it's clearer for you and it's right clearer. Now it's more the second. Like doubts in my full commitment to get that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to just get what I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's resolve that doubt. In order to get somewhere, you need to leave it in the first place. In order to get somewhere, you need to be out of that place in the first place. Mm -hmm. To get back home, you need to first walk out of your home so that the whole intention of getting back home will make sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's a very simple example to inquire into this together now. The thing is, you never left yourself because it's impossible. It's simply impossible to leave yourself. It actually doesn't make any sense. You are nothing but yourself. It doesn't matter what state you are in. Absolutely makes no difference whatsoever. So in other words, you cannot leave your consciousness, nor can you return to consciousness. It's simply impossible. It doesn't even matter if we try. Yes, of course I understand from human perspective it is perfectly possible. Like we lost Right? We feel lost. We can even say that in terms of that more kind of um, traditional way. We lost our way, you know. We lost our faith in God and so forth, right? And then we try to regain that. 
We can lose faith and gain faith, but we can never lose ourselves. We can lose faith in God, but we can never, never lose the Godness that we are. The self actually doesn't even live in you. You live in the self. It's just a matter of perspective. Yes, we could say, again, this is all because language, it's what limits everything. It's the very surface affair. Language is the surface affair. Whenever something is given to language, it's totally perplexed already. It's distorted. The Russian poet said, truth exclaimed is a lie. A writer. The truth exclaimed is a lie. It is impossible to speak the truth. Ultimately speaking, it is impossible to speak the ultimate truth. Because it will be already distorted truth. Therefore, we understand language always has its limitations. It's the final, the gross level of, if you will, expression of pure potentiality within consciousness. It's like known as the gross expression of speech. That's what language is. Not this or that, every language, all languages are that. What happens, of course, in these kind of discourses and why there is any validity in the discourse on the spiritual matters is because the language is used as an aid, simply as a help, as a pointer. Or, or if there is greater dimension or deeper dimension from where the language comes to surface, through the vocal cords of the one who delivers it, if it comes from the depth of that realization, then it has the power to deliver and transform. Otherwise, it doesn't. If you go to scholars, you know, like it's amazing lecture they can deliver, but it doesn't do anything to your consciousness. It did something to your mind. It add into the basket of your goods. It certainly add to the information about something. It certainly added to your knowledge about something, which in itself is good, of course. But it did not do much to transform your consciousness. The purpose of the darshan is very different. The purpose of the darshan is to transform your consciousness in whichever way, in however little way, in however big way. Therefore, when you tell me that you do not have, or you have a doubt how you can go back, or how can you essentially regain your consciousness or regain the self. And the immediate response is that you cannot do that. It's impossible. So already that hope needs to be flushed down. It needs to be relieved of. It's a false, essentially, pretext. You cannot gain that which you are. It's impossible. How can I get that what I am? If I'm sitting in my house, example was given, I cannot say to myself suddenly, I need to get home. I'm at home, perfectly at ease. I'm even wearing socks now, <laughs> you know? In the moment I'll be in my jammies, you know? <laughs> and so I have this idea, I need to get home. I need to get home. I go to the kitchen and start making coffee because I need to have energy, I need to get home. You know, it's all this sudden agitation comes in because I'm not at home. Why don't you feel at home? That's a different story. Why, whilst you are at home, it doesn't feel like at home? That's the question. But how can you doubt the fact that you are at home whilst you are at home? So the question is not even there. I have to deconstruct your question. We have together, we have to deconstruct the question. 
Because there's no going anywhere. We never go anywhere. Yes, there is a term, there is a language in search of the divine. Yes, of course there is. But we have to immediately bring that to the focal point of our attention. By very simple realization that we cannot possibly gain that which illumines in the first place absolutely everything here from within. Your doubt itself has no independent existence outside of your own awareness. It belongs to awareness. This is why it's very important to formulate questions. It's very important to ask question from the right place. Like really, that question contains the answer. Otherwise, the question would have to be questioned. Therefore, I questioned your question. How is it possible to get home while you are at home? That's about homecoming. Yes. So if that is clearly resolved, that this doubt cannot have any validity because it simply has no grounds to stand on. In other words, what I invite you to is to make that quantum leap, if you will, is to make that transition to abandon any hope to get anywhere. Like literally forget about all this hope to become more than you are. You will never be more conscious than you are right now. I'm talking blasphemy in a way because the whole Practices is about to become more conscious. But in the essence, you cannot be more of your essence than you are already, no matter how much you try. You can try to come out of that essence, or you try to come closer to that essence. It's impossible, because all there is is essence. You are the self, one without a second. You are yourself. This is your experience as you sit there. Okay, you may protest and say, well, that is a limited experience because I only feel like this person. That's fine. That is your experience, legitimate experience within, within your own consciousness. First, you need to position yourself where you are so that there is a, a proper journey. Otherwise, we embark on a journey which doesn't take us anywhere because we want to travel somewhere where we already are. We do not travel. We do not travel. There's no travel, no astral travel, no any travel. It's all, all fantasy. Talks with no corresponding reality. So what is the doubt then? Where the doubt rises from? What is there? essentially what plays the role of the doubt. Because we just have established, and I have given you a direct suggestion to abandon any hope to get anywhere because you cannot get more consciousness or you cannot get more of yourself than you are. <coughs> I had glimpses of uh, a few experiences of, of that self. Huh? And I have this longing to be back. And mm -hmm. I fully understand uh, what you just said. I just really got it that you cannot go anywhere because you already are. But it's this longing to feel home. Mm -hmm. Although I am at home, I understand. But I don't, those glimpses, I mean, you get those experiences that you just want to be back there. There are two different things you speak about, because I also hear you clear, loud and clear. You speak about longing for those moments when you have perhaps experienced that sense of unity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or that sense of connectedness, that sense of intimacy, 
whatever that is, intimacy with yourself, intimacy with the divine, that sense of utter belonging. And we can expand and spoke, speak more about that. It's to get back to where we felt complete. Yeah. We, f we felt in fullness of our being. That is a legitimate desire. There's nothing wrong with that. Yet, we need to clearly also position ourselves and understand. And it is very helpful to understand that there is something we call experience. There is something we call experience, a temporal state, that has a rise, it has a beginning, it has a duration, and it has its end. And as with all experiences, it's not everlasting. It rises and goes. It subsides, sorry, it rises and subsides, as it were. And if we examine sincerely, we don't need to go to university now. Everything is that, absolutely everything. Every functioning from the most basic, what we call primitive functioning of our physiology, to a more refined activity of our mind and intellect. Everything is that. And that, of course, includes also spiritual practice and the effects of spiritual practice. We can be in samadhi, in meditation and enter samadhi, and we are in that beatitude, we are in that spacious awareness. And nothing bothers us there. And then it wanes, it has to subside. We cannot remain samadhi for too long. We cannot. Okay, there are some great yogis, there are some great examples of, you know, so and so, that many days in samadhi. Okay, two years in samadhi, in a cave maybe. It's still ended, two years it's ended. Two hours or 20 minutes or two years, it's not permanent. I just want you to understand that it's still that most desired state of complete, complete expansiveness and being consciousness and nothing else, with metabolic activity equals to nil, nothing to be bothered by. It's still subsided. And that consciousness which essentially why we are embodied in this physiology takes over. So understanding that everything has its rise and everything has to subside is a healthy understanding. I don't want any of you to have this idea that great beings, great enlightened beings, continuously remain in a state of rupture. It is not true. It's exaggeration. It's not true. Very often disciples like to make the stories because it makes them feel good about their teachers. There's a whole tradition of that. But if you actually converse directly with those, they will tell you that enlightened being is also subject to wanting to go to sleep, wanting to eat, wanting to go for a stroll, wanting to stroke a dog, and if he's married, he wants to have a cuddle and he wants to have conversation with children. Or maybe you want to give them a juicy smack if they're not. Life goes as normal, as usual. Yes, there are states when reality is rendered. But it also rises and subsides. Everything rises and subsides. But what's permanent in all this? What's permanent in all this? In all this, what rises and subsides, let's find out what is permanent there. The being? The consciousness? Yourself. Mm -hmm. You yourself is permanent there. Mm -hmm. Not you yourself with attributes as a personality, mm -hmm. but as the witness of all this what takes place. That is the only permanent thing there is. Nothing else is. Yes, of course, when we experience this amazing 
amazing breakthroughs, it's actually good to be prepared that some of them never to be experienced with the same intensity. Never to be experienced with the same intensity. Everything has its first time. Everything. There is always novelty to something which is the first time. And we know the big difference between the first love and the mature love. The first love, of course, is characterized by great, great romanticism, right? Trepidation and all this, like, this, the sheer agony of it, the sheer intensity of it. And the mature love is very different. It doesn't have that, but it has another intensity. It's steeped, steeped in that what you share with the one you love or those you love. Because by that time, we hope that love is not pointed only to one being. Hopefully, we have enough space in our heart to include more people, more beings into that space of love. So what is permanent there? What is permanent in all this? That is the only valid thing. That is the only lasting thing. And that is all there is and can never be taken from you. Therefore, your search ends tonight. You go to sleep searchless. You go to sleep free of all this worry because your doubts come simply groundless. We will expand on the topic of what then spiritual journey is if the search is over. There is a lot of territory to cover. But first there has to be this understanding that all there is, is the self. One without the second. And it's myself. And not someone else's self. And not self somewhere in some realm one day when I'm pure enough, I might be able to enter. No. You are forever living in the self, as the self. Everything, everything is contained by that self. And within that self, everything rises. Everything. As beauty and agony. As, be as these beatific experiences and as boring experiences or as horrifying experiences. Everything rises in that. But everything that rises will subside because that's the nature of things. But yourself is not subject to all these comings and goings. Therefore, I recommend you abandon any hope to get back to the experiences you had before. It's like wanting, being a mature person, right? Mature lady, and wanting to go back to the first love. I'm sorry, it's like a wishful thinking, you know? Come on, let's grow up. It happened, we've been there, we've done it. Come on, you know, let's move on. There are more things to experience in life, right? That's just on a personal note, my mother once really surprised me when she told me that she loved the strongest when she was 65. I mean, not just that year alone, but when she reached that age. That's when she said that she experienced the fullness of love. Love for a particular being. We're not speaking about universal love that is... Yeah. It was interesting. For me, it was kind of revelatory to hear that back then. So, what is about the doubt then? What else do you doubt? Where is the doubt? What else do you doubt? Because it's important that we speak about the doubt. You cannot doubt the self, because you cannot doubt yourself. It's kind of an oxymoron. If you think about that, contemplate on that, 
how can you doubt that what you are? Faith you can doubt. Because when we have a faith, it's in something, someone. Even if it's a Lord, it's still, it's outside of myself. Yourself is all you are. It instructs you continuously. It doesn't matter whether you live as a contracted being or expanded being. It's always yourself that you are. You're never someone else, you see. You cannot be someone else, even if you try. Why? Because the self takes care of that. So this is why even formulating the question, even coming up with the question, what we really doubt, is very important. Where would the doubt now be? What would be the territory of the doubt? Let's, let's look into that. No, there's no doubt. <laughs> no, no, I fully get it. There's no doubt. But I have a next question. <laughs> that's totally fine. Yeah. That's, that's how it goes. This is totally legitimate. I am the self, we are the self. That self is consciousness, and consciousness is love. How can I manifest myself more as love? That's my question. Mm. The only way to know that is to love. The answer to love is love itself. It cannot be anywhere else. We cannot outsmart. When it comes to love, it's the most direct. We cannot use leverage here. Because love is the greatest force, because love is equals the self. Love is God. God is love. Love equals consciousness. But here there is this air of urgency and I and I feel that. And so when you ask that, you ask out of that sincerity, how can you carry more love? How can you be open more to love? And the only way, the only way is to love. You see, the answer to love is love itself. To know and to learn to love, we have to give ourselves to love. The only remedy for to know is to love more. There's no other way to know because love does not have an analogy. It's not made of poles of opposites. Love is not an opposite of hate. It's not at all true. Love is unity. Love is union itself. It's totality of our being. And we know that very well. Each and every one of us know that when we love, we feel whole. We feel complete, total. There's nothing lacking. There may be this and that lacking. On a superficial level, a lot of things may be still lacking in our life. But it doesn't bother us because we are filled. Our heart feels alive and full. That fullness swells our chest. It's literally physically even, no? It's physically feels. You feel, when you feel this swelling power of love, you feel it even, even, even as if your chest expands. It cannot contain it. But I cannot give you any recipe of how to love more, of how to embody love more. There's no recipe. If I, if I can tell you, meditate more. That, that, or, you know, start doing selfless service. All this is valid, of course. 
you know, give yourself more to people, forget about your own problems, be of service. All this will be valid. But in essence, nothing, nothing can be learned about love other than through love. So one way or the other, it only God can teach us about God. In a way, only love can teach us about love. So love is the answer to your question. But since we did speak about doubt and you brought that up, I don't want to leave this without um, something that also makes sense to bring to our attention, is that doubt has its place. And I, some of you may remember we talked about it last year. Doubt has its place. It has its value even. There is a saying, doubt is the last thing to leave. It's the last barrier to surrender. It's the last, last barrier to surrender, the doubt. And the last, essentially, the last predicament. It is also exemplified by that very beautiful encounter between, it's the last encounter of Christ with his disciples at the, at the supper, not the last supper. I forgot it was in the house. Where was the last, where, where was the supper? The last encounter of Christ with the disciples, any of you here? No? You don't remember? It's not a Gethsemane garden. It's the, well, after Christ was essentially, purportedly um, taken from the cross and resurrected, right? He appeared in front of some of the disciples. First, he appeared in front of the Mary Magdalene. And set, second one, he was, yes, he was at the supper. He came where some of his disciples were. And the encounter between St. Thomas took place, where St. Thomas doubted, even after all this, what Christ went through, he still has his doubts. And Christ lifted his shirt and showed him the wound, wound from the spear, yeah. and asked Thomas to stick his finger into it. It's a metaphor as well. Place your finger into my wound. And that only the thing that will resolve your doubt. Nothing else will. And that's indeed what Thomas did. He placed his finger right into the wound of Christ. Of course, this is all elaborate metaphor, right? Of what happens to the psychology, what happens to our psyche. And we talked about it at the Tantric Christ in Mallorca last year and in California two years ago. But here it's valid to the question that doubt has its place and why that doubt is the last to leave is because doubt could also be the driving force as well in itself. Doubt leads to discrimination as well. Correctly used, properly used doubt can actually assist us in a way. But excessive doubt, indiscriminate doubt, you see, Using doubt to discriminate can be, can be the power that assists us. But if we use doubt indiscriminately, then of course it will be a great predicament to our development. If we constantly doubt, we constantly doubt this, we constantly doubt that, and it becomes a habit. And habitually we doubt without our ability, without the ability of those who are around us, 
without the ability of the one who can help us and the one who can guide us and the doubts, endless doubts enter. But doubt, doubt itself has a place because it leads to a place of resolution. So we do and we are advised to press with the doubt, to resolve it. So it's very good to come up and resolve the doubt. To sit with the doubt, it's like sitting with unresolved issues. It's not healthy. It's good to bring doubt to the resolution. So that is the place of a doubt, because that resolution will create a shift. It will create an energetic opening. It will create an opening, full stop. But just to sit with the doubt and create a pact with the doubt, that I would not advise to anyone. Because sometimes that's what we do, because then it becomes a sabotage. We're sabotaging ourselves. And the doubt is that very, very skillful excuse. You see? Because I doubt, and we, I doubt. I doubt this, I doubt that. Strategy is created there. Strategy to avoid. So when doubt is used as a strategy to avoid being faced with resolution, then it's very counterproductive. It's not desirable. It's literally, literally, in, in any spiritual tradition, would be considered as a malignancy, which we are better off without. But in itself, doubt can be healthy, because that leads to greater discrimination. I doubt this, I want to go and find out. See? And that finding out relieves that doubt. Simple as that. Mm 